If you will, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul was given of God, he was given a deformity of some kind. We don't, we're never told what it is in the Scripture. But whatever it was, it was a great hindrance to him or he saw it as a great hindrance in his ministry to men. And most speculate that it had something to do with his eyes because of the scales that were on them and so on in his conversion and, and all of these things. But we're never really told what it was. He told the Galatians, he said, I bear you witness when I came to you, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. It seems to hint that it had something to do with his facial features or his eyes or something. But whatever it was, he saw it as a great hindrance to his uh, ministry. And so he prays to the Lord to take it away. Now Paul's seen, he's prayed over many sinners and he's, he's watched their illnesses taken away. He's fully confident that the Lord can take care of this ailment, whatever it is. And so he prays, but it stays. And he prays again. And he prays a third time. And after praying the third time, he said in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And the Lord said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, Paul reasons of this thing again. And he said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. When our Lord comforted His suffering saint, He used these words, My grace is sufficient. And He didn't say those things only as an expression of passion, but and, and of love and of assurance to His Apostle, but of an active, eternal, irresistible force, which the, which the Scriptures call the grace of God. Don't ever mistake the grace of God for simply a passion. That's how religion expresses God's love and God's grace as a passion. It's not a passion. It's a force. And he tells us over in the book of Romans, he said that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so grace might reign unto eternal life, reign unto righteousness, through eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a force. It is a power. It is not just the gift of God, but the God who gives. And, and there's power involved in this thing. There's, there's a might and a, and a principle involved in these things that accomplishes what it's given to do. He said this about our faith. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You had never believed. I was talking to Joe last night and I told him, I said, as deeply as you were dug into that refuge, you think about it, how deeply, how influenced, how grounded and settled you were in that refuge. And yet a word from God and the refuge, the walls of the refuge come tumbling down. That's grace. Grace is not just a passion. It's a force. And this grace is bestowed through His Gospel. That's why I'm here this morning. I believe that with all my heart. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. You can't accomplish it. You, can't, you can grit your teeth and clench your fist and determine with everything you have, I'm going to... No, you're not. 
No, you're not. Not till God enables you. And when He does, it'll be the simplest thing in the world to embrace Him. Embrace Him. That's an act of grace. And here, our Lord tells Paul, that's what he's worried about. He's worried about this ministry. He's worried about how he's going to accomplish these things that God sent him to do. And he's, he's looking to himself. That's what we do. We look to ourselves. And our Lord's trying to get him to... I hate to use that word trying. Our, our Lord is going to take him away from looking at himself. And he's going to turn his eyes to him. And he said, my grace, Paul, is sufficient. It's sufficient. This grace in Christ was then, is now, and ever shall be sufficient in all things. Comprehended of God and considered in the giving of this grace is all things. All things. How many times do you read in the Scripture where He talks about Christ being given all things? All things. And you just let your imagination go as far as it can go. And you still want to reach the end of it. All things. Every event, every advent, every situation, every circumstance, every act of divine providence from beginning to end is comprehended in God's eternal purpose of grace. Paul said, we have obtained an inheritance way down the road. God blessed us back in the beginning. He put us in Christ back in the beginning. He predestinated us under the adoption of Son way back in the beginning. But He said, In time, we obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. And what is that purpose? He tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.9, God has saved us called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Alright, let me give you several things this morning that God has done, is now doing, that manifest this all-sufficient grace. Now we tend, we want some assurance, we want some evidence, that's all flesh. We, We want this and we want that. What's given to us is an all-sufficient Savior. And if you're looking for evidence of your election and you're looking for uh, some assurance in your salvation, it's all in Him. Embrace Him and you have everything God has for sinners is in Him. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you're complete in Him. And those feelings will come and go. But He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Alright, let me give you several things. First of all, His grace was sufficient. We're talking about sufficient grace. Here's this apostle and he's considering this great, uh, this great grace that's been given to him, this great privilege to go out and preach his gospel, and he's looking to himself and seeing himself inadequate as, as he should. And, and Christ tells him, my grace is sufficient. It's sufficient. Alright? When we're talking about sufficient grace in Christ, what are we talking about? Well, let me give you eight things. First of all, his grace was sufficient enough in Christ for him to... Uh, to make on our behalf an everlasting covenant. Now you think about this. An everlasting covenant. When David, the man after God's own heart, when he died, his dying words, you should have them memorized by now. Although it be not so with my house, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant. Now listen to this. Ordered in all things and sure. This everlasting covenant before, before time began, before creation came to be, before anything was done, way back yonder, for lack of a better word, in the council halls of eternity, God the Trinity made with themselves an everlasting covenant. And they appointed Christ as the surety of that covenant. And all things ordered in that covenant were sure because of the surety. You want to talk about all-sufficient grace? Here it is. 
Here it is. Everything that God has willed to do in His redemptive purpose is in Christ. He's the surety. That's all sufficient grace, isn't it? All sufficient grace. In his dying words, David said that. This is all my salvation and all my desire. Every provision was made, every appointment filled, and Paul wrote to Timothy and said he saved us according, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace given us in Christ before the world began. I was uh, going through the book of Genesis and I completed chapter 1 on the creation series. And I began to meditate on verse 1 of chapter 2. I tell you, it's worth your time to go there and look at that. God finished all of His works and it said He rested. And I was talking to Joe about this last night. Didn't God know that Satan was still in the world? Had He forgotten that Satan was cast out in the earth? Did God not know that Satan was going to enter into his garden? And by temptation caused the woman's fall, and by the woman's fall caused the man to fall, and by his fall caused the whole human race to fall? Did God not know that? Did He not know that just in a few generations that every imagination of the thoughts of men was going to be only evil continually, and it's going to repent Him that He ever made man But by His grace, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. By His grace, He saved eight souls. Did He not know in a few more generations that Satan was going to, His his influence on humanity was going to come to a, a peak in Babylon? And such a peak it came to that God had to confuse the languages. And having confused them and sent them out worldwide, did you know that clear to the end of this book false religion, antichrist religion is called Babylon did God not know that? did God not know when he sent his son into this world that men were going to despise him and hate him torment him and hound him every day of his life that they were going to murder him on a cross did God not know that? If God knew these things, how could He rest? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 gives us the answer. Look at this. He said that our salvation, according to this great God who predestinated us and worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Now listen to this who first trusted in Christ. That's not talking about you. That's talking about God. God first trusted in Christ. When did He do that? In the everlasting covenant of grace. Trusted all things into His hands. Now listen to this. And He rested. Read that next verse. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. I tell you, you can trust Him. In Him is all sufficient grace, so much so, so completely so, that God Himself trusted all things into His hand and rested. Rested. And you will too if you ever see Him. If you ever see that grace of God in Him, you'll rest in Him. You'll enter into that rest. Secondly, His grace was sufficient in Christ to create a world which He knew could not stand on its own. Creation, as it's set forth in the Holy Scriptures, I don't know if you've ever even thought about this, is an act of God's mediator. You ever think about that? Over and over and over, Scripture says that Christ created the world. John chapter 1, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Same was in the beginning with God, and all things were created by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. 
this mediator, he which was chosen to mediate the sovereign redemptive will of God. That's what he tells us in Hebrews 10. He said, in the, in the whole of the book, it's written of me, I come to do thy will. What will? His redemptive will. That's why he came. And he which was chosen to mediate the sovereign redemptive will of God was assigned the work of creation. Paul said, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, this is over in Hebrews chapter 1, spake in times past unto our fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now listen to this. Whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. How did God create the world? Through his Son. Through his Son. Listen to this scripture, Colossians 1.15. Paul's talking about and describing his Redeemer to the Colossian people, giving them some assurance in Christ, talking about this light into which they'd been called, having been made meet to be partakers of this inheritance of Christ. And he tells them that this Christ, their Redeemer, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, if you have a margin in your Bible, some of them are going to say this, creation. Not creature, creation. He is the firstborn of every created thing. Now, look, watch this next verse, verse 16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him, now watch this, and for Him. You mean creation is for our Savior? That's exactly what I'm saying. And that's what, you talk about all sufficient grace. The whole of creation, the whole of God's redemptive purpose with men And creation that sustains man was given to our Savior who created it. And I I tell you, the longer I live, the more I see His work demonstrated in the things He created. He is before all things, Paul said, and by Him all things consist. They have a continuance. Why don't things just fold up and blow up and blow away? (laughs) We're told that's what's going to happen. The ozone's going to disappear, and I don't know what the thing's going to happen then. The stars are going to cave in, or we're going to get sucked down a black hole, or what it is that they believe. But here it says, He is before all things, and by Him all things have a continuance. And He's the head of the body, this one who created the world, and the world created for Him. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the federal head. He's the beginning. He's the representative of God's elect who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, now listen, that he might have the preeminence. And as some of you have been questioned by your relatives, saying, now wait a minute, you're exalting Christ above the Trinity? Read the next verse. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You're not going to anger the Trinity when you exalt Christ because it's the purpose of the Trinity to exalt Christ. (coughs) He was chosen to that station. Men talk about creation as though it was a powerless, purposeless mass set afloat on a great sea of eternity and left to uh, shape itself with some unknown circumstance. The Bible has a different explanation. In Romans chapter 8 verse 19 it says, For the earnest expectation of creation does what? What's it waiting for? Why why does creation continue on? What's what's the purpose of it? What's the purpose behind it? Why was it made? What's it going to do? The earnest expectation of creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God because that's why it was made. That's the end for which it made. Listen to this. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, 
but by reason of Him who created the same in hope. Thirdly, now we're talking about the all-sufficient grace. This one uh, whom I exhort you to put your trust in, embrace Him, rest in Him, look to Him. You don't need anything else but Him. You have Him, you have everything. He's like that pearl of great price. When the man saw it, he knew he was a collector of pearls. He knew there was not another pearl on this earth like this pearl, and he gave everything he had to have it. Everything's in Christ. All hope's in Him. Everything's in Christ. So, this is what we're talking about. This all-sufficient grace. And the grace of God in Christ was sufficient to defer God's judgment of men to the Redeemer. Now, I don't know if you know this, but God outside of Christ is a consuming fire. It, it, Spurgeon said it, it, if we were to approach Him apart from Christ, it would be like a butterfly going into a bonfire. You, you, you wouldn't get anywhere. you just burn up, burn the cinders. So why didn't God, at the first act of the sin of man, why didn't He just burn this whole creation to cinders and start over? Because that judgment was deferred to Christ our Redeemer. Because God had purposed to save a people for the glory of His name. And He appointed His Son as the Savior, the Redeemer, the Mediator. Oh, I'm telling you, you talk about all sufficient grace. Here it is. Here it is. God looks on this evil, wicked world. I'm telling you, the more, when you begin to learn something about sin, you won't even want to look in the mirror. What we are by nature is the more you know about God, the more you'll see about yourself. It, it's like what Joe said last night. You can try to convince me of anything when I'm standing in the dark, but turn the light on. Now I can see. And the brighter that light shines, the more things you see. And it's the same with Christ. The more of Him you see and the more of God you see, the more of your sin you see. And and there's no hope in yourself. It's just a black hole. The hope's all in Christ. All in Christ. He deferred the judgment of men to the Redeemer. Peter said, somebody said, well, the Lord's not coming back. That's a bunch of garbage. They talk about Him coming back, talk about His judgment. Peter said, this men are willingly ignorant of. That God destroyed the first world, saving only eight souls. That first world stood in the water and out of the water by His command, by His Word. He's the one who gathered the seas into its place and gave the commandment, Here shall your proud ways come, but no further. God gave these commands. God ordered all things. And, and, and it's God Himself who preserves these things. And, and by that Word, this first world that then existed, He said it stayed just like it was by God's command until God gave command otherwise. And then it was destroyed. It was destroyed. And he said, the world which is now is being kept in store by that same word reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And then he says this, he said, but the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, talking about His return, but is long-suffering to usward has nothing to do with this world, has nothing to do with God's love for this world. The reason this world is going on as it is, the reason it consists, the reason it's being preserved and shall never be destroyed until God gives the Word, is because God is not slack concerning His promises to us for it. Not willing that any should perish. None of His elect is going to perish whom He gave to Christ. 
whom he appointed surety of the covenant, whom whom he import, uh, appointed the the guarantor, the one mediator between God and men, the Lord Jesus Christ. His long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, and none shall perish. None shall perish, but that all should be brought to repentance. Judgment's been turned over to the sovereign mediator. When all of his elect have been righteously saved and called to him, then shall the pure and unbridled judgment of God be exercised on this world. Peter describes it. You can read it for yourself over in Second Peter, I think it's chapter 3. He said the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. This, this world as we know it is going to pass away. But God's elect shall sit with Christ as He justly judges this unbelieving world. That's all sufficient grace. And His grace, fourthly, was sufficient in His Son to manifest a holy union of His people in the body of a man who is the Son of God and the Son of Man. A holy union in Him. Paul summed up our ministry this way. He said, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not charging their trespasses unto them. And this is the only basis of reconciliation. This is the only ministry of reconciliation that we've been given to preach. That reconciliation is in the man, Christ Jesus, the God-man. In a short while, the Lord willing, I'm going to baptize five of you people. This baptism confesses their hope of union with Christ. That's what we're going to demonstrate in the water. We were buried with Him. It tells us that in Ephesians chapter 2. Buried with Him. Risen with Him. Ascended with Him. Seated at the right hand of God. That's union with Christ. And there's no salvation apart from that union. Eternal covenant union by which God chose us in Him and blessed us in Him. And by physical union. The Scripture said He took not on Himself the nature of angels. What did He do? He took on Him the seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham. God in man in one person. You see that union? That union that was manifested in in that perfect man was the same union given to us by covenant before the world began. And it's that same union that we receive by faith. That's what I believe. if If I'm a saved man, if I have any hope of glory, it's Christ in me. My union with Him has nothing to... I don't have anything to do with it. I don't have any part in it. It's all of Him. All of Him. In Him, it says, we have redemption through His blood. Oh my. To look on Christ with eyes of faith is to see yourself in Him, obeying the law. Oh, you have to obey the law. I did. I did. Perfectly. You're going to have to face God now. You better be careful what you say. Uh-huh. Justified in Him. When God raised Him, for, He was delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification. I'm justified in Him. Seated with Him in the heavens. Alright, fifth. His grace was sufficient in Christ to put away our sins through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There you go. A preacher, what are you going to... you saying you don't sin? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. If we say that, the truth's not in us. Isn't that what John said? And we make God a liar. We sin every day. I can't have a thought that's not mixed with sin. I can't pray a prayer that's not mixed with sin. I begin to pray a prayer and I begin to think about myself and how I'm saying it and how everybody's looking on it and how they're here. I I can't pray a prayer without sin. 
Can't preach a message without sin. But I don't have any sin in the sense that my sin has been put away. Once for all. It's gone. It's gone. And one day, He'll deliver me from the presence of it. And take me into glory without sin. Without sin. Listen to this Scripture. Ephesians 1 verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace. That's what we're talking about. All sufficient grace. Wherein He hath, He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. You ever look at that Scripture and consider yourself when it's talking about the Father looking on you? And He says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter the... You can't look yourself in in the mirror and say that, can you? But God can. Because He hath made us accepted in the blood. In verse 7 it says, We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Oh, my soul. Listen to these Scriptures. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Just about everybody I know in religion. Huh? Satan does. He's the accuser of the brethren. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. He justified us. Who is He that condemneth? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. In Christ, my sins have been put away. That's all sufficient grace. A man came, uh, the God-man came to this world and bore my sin, was made sin, it says over in 2 Corinthians 5.21. How was he made sin? By virtue of my union with him. He not only stood before God as God Himself, sinless man, but He stood before God as me the sinner. And God poured out His wrath on me. And in Him I died. I died. Sixthly, His grace is sufficient in Christ to raise us up together and cause us to sit together with Him in heaven itself. Paul preached these things to the Colossians, and then he said, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. Because your life, you're dead, and your life is hid with God in Christ. And when He shall appear, you're going to appear with Him. You've always been with Him. You were put in Him before you was ever created. You put in Him. Sitting upon the Father's throne is the guarantor of our salvation. I remember Brother Mayhem was uh, walking to church one warm spring day, and he was—he didn't live too far from the church, just three or four blocks. And he decided to walk that morning, and he was out walking, and he was coming down 13th Street, and he ran into a man that he knew and went to seminary with, and they began to exchange pleasantries there on the sidewalk, and. And uh, after a minute or two, this man looked at him and he said, uh, Brother Mahan, he said, are you still saved? And Brother Mahan looked down for a minute and then he looked this guy in the eyes and he said, is God still on the throne? Christ still seated at the right hand of God? I'm still saved. That's my salvation. That's my salvation. Every ounce of my salvation depended on Him. Alright, here's the seventh thing. His grace by virtue of His work and God's purpose of grace in Him is sufficient to begat dead sinners. That's all sufficient grace. Sufficient to begat dead sinners to life everlasting by His spoken Word. After His resurrection, the Lord roamed this earth for almost 30 days. And at the end of that time, He gathered His apostles, His disciples, who were His apostles, around Him, and they walked out 
to a hill. And the Lord turned to them and He said, All power in heaven and earth given unto Me. Go home and rest. That ain't what He said. Put your hands in your pockets. That's not what He said. Go ye now into all the world and teach My Gospel to every nation. He that believeth and is baptized is going to be saved. They shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. This saving power that was given to our Lord as He prays in His high priestly prayer in John 17, He said, was given to Him to give eternal life to as many as the Father had given Him. And he's telling them that this, this power is now, act, it's always been his, but by virtue of his life and death and his accomplishments, it's given to him. And now he said, the same effectual grace is going to be on you, and you're going to go preach. Wow. Preach something that the world despises. They despise the very Son of God, and you want me to go preach the Son? Exactly. And His grace is so sufficient that it will begat dead sinners through that gospel. Isn't that what Paul said? He said, uh, "He said you have uh, I can't remember how he words it now, but anyway, he said, I have begotten you through the gospel. You just have one Father, one spiritual Father. He said, I have begotten you through the gospel. A man said that. You think Paul believed that he had power to begat dead sinners? No. But he believed in God's purpose of grace and His all-sufficient grace that appointed him as a preacher and sent him. That's right. I don't have any power. I can't, I can't. The most I can do to you this morning is exactly what I'm doing. Telling you the truth. Trying to point you to Christ. I do that everywhere I go by the grace of God. And then I wait on Him. Because I don't have the power to go any further. Any further. And then finally, His all-sufficient grace is able to sustain the weakest, sickest, most suffering saint who ever lived. You think about that. Oh, I think about that leper who came to Christ. and though He describes in detail the lepers in the Old Testament. There, it was a a living death. It, it just eat away the flesh and, and exposed and they under the commandment of the Jewish law they had to have a rag and they kept it over their mouth and anytime they come anywhere near anybody they were to cry unclean, unclean, unclean. And here comes this leper and he probably got holes in his jaws and he's covered with leprosy and he's dying and he come, and he's forbidden to even come anywhere near here he comes, right up to Christ, falls down on the ground, and he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. If you will. Huh? Do you believe that? Do you believe in his hands is the power to cleanse a filthy sinner? Huh? That leper did. And you know what the Lord said? He gave him this big, complicated... No. He said, I will. And he was clean. He was clean. And that's just how it happens under the preaching of the gospel. That's just how he saves sinners. That grace is all sufficient. Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul opens his letter to the Corinthians with these words, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our trouble, that we might be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort we, wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. That is all sufficient for he exercises and manifests that grace in a believer and that believer can't keep his mouth shut. How often did our Lord tell, tell those He saved, He said, now go your way and don't you tell anybody what I did. They told everybody they knew what He did. They couldn't help it. Couldn't help it. And that's the way it is when God puts His gospel in a man's heart. He couldn't shut his mouth if He wanted to. He's going to tell everybody He knows. Everybody He knows. All sufficient 
grace in Christ. Father, use the lesson this morning. Press it home to our hearts and our minds and not only help us to understand it, but apply it to our hearts. Make it a part of us. Make it a part of our daily lives. We ask it for Christ's sake. Amen.